It's great to be here. Jackie and I just flew back from Dallas, Texas, in our last week of vacation and visiting Ray and Elise and Elijah and Isabella, and we had a wonderful time. The only thing that was shocking about this visit was um, I, always, I usually wear a cowboy hat to protect my skin from the sun, and, and I'm from cowboy country in the Tri-Cities, and, and it doesn't mean I was a cowboy, but I did clean a few stalls in my time. I don't know if that counts qualifies. But the whole time when I was down in Dallas, I was wearing my cowboy hat. I didn't see one person with the cowboy hat. I'm so disappointed. I mean, like, they knew I was coming, and they just got rid of them, and it's, it's going out of style or something. But um, it's great to be here today, and we don't, I don't have a handout for you. We just flew into town. And, um, but if you have your Bible, you can follow along as we started in the book of Exodus chapter 20, and we're going to end up in John chapter 4. And we're launching a brand new series called Setting the Table. And um, I don't know about you, there's a lot of chores in the house that um, I don't necessarily enjoy doing. But, um, and there's some that I don't mind at all. In fact, um, Jackie just will, will flash out the... Um, um, signal for me to do that. It's kind of like an audible call. You know, I might be watching the game or, or something. And uh, for some reason, all through my life, I've been called initials. So like when I was a kid, I was called TD. Now that I'm a grandpa, I'm called uh, GP. And um, I don't know what other initials I'm called, but Jackie will say, uh, GP, unload the DW. And, uh, which is dishwasher, you know, and it's like, that's an immediate sign I'm supposed to go unload the DW. Uh, another job that I don't mind, and anyone might have it, is set the table. And you can tell I like the job of setting the table because that means it's dinner time. <laughs> and we are at our house, and I hope that every one of you can come over to our house today. No, not today, my wife Jackie's here. <laughs> But you could come over today and watch the game if you're not recording it. But um, it, and we have a dinner party, and when you're invited to someone's house to be a part of the set at the table, uh, you're in a, you're involved in a conversation. And in days ago, a long, long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, when I was young, and I had hair, it was a different galaxy, a bizarro galaxy. Um, you came to church on Sunday, if you didn't have any food at your house, just talk to the right people and you'd get invited over for dinner. And we had four boys, and my mom was at the table for at least eight or ten, because we were always bringing friends over for, for dinner, and the question was, would there be anything left by the time my dad got home? And um, it was just a common thing. In fact, our four boys, who would usually travel with at least four more, if we were walking across town to go to the baseball park or something like that, and we got hungry, we'd just go up to someone's house we didn't even know and knock on the door, and say, do you guys have any food around here? And they would set the table and, and serve us a meal. That was the kind of community that I was raised in. And now when we have a dinner party, uh, we might have the Jacobs in. We hope to have the Hamilton. We had the Hamiltons over, but we like to have both of them together because their kids play well together. And we like to have Ben and Becca and any other people like that. And it just turns into a, a festive experience. And uh, not only do we put our food together, but pretty soon the toy box comes open that we have in the middle of our living room. And someone turns on the music, and it's a dance party. And I've got my um, phone out, and I'm videotaping it. And uh, people like Soraya say, you better not post this on Facebook. And um, adults and children dancing together, dogs and cats uh, 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 playing together. It's a really chaos. But it's an enjoyable time to be very personal and not institutional. And it's what we're calling this series, Rex actually is the creative force behind the series, a vision of setting the God-given goals and dreams that he would give us for not only this year, but for the next 10 years. We're setting the table for a feast. So, circle on your calendar, 2025. For me, the most important 10 years of my life. And I don't want to just wander wherever the crowd takes me or whatever the circumstances take me to go wherever I might happen to be reacting from one thing to another. I want to be purposeful. I want to be well-intended. I want to follow what God's plan and God's vision is for my life. So the next four weeks, we're going to be sharing some input with you and asking you to join us at the table to have conversation as you set the goals for, for your life and for your family. And it's important that you do set the goals. 
I was telling Elise when uh, down with um, Elijah and Isabel, I said, remember when we raised you? I said, um, education is too important to leave it up to the schools. We didn't count on the, the schools were there to help, but we were going to teach each subject to our kids. If they didn't get it at school, we would teach, teach it to them. And sometimes we had to relearn it ourselves. But that was something that was going to be important to our family and going to be accomplished. Same way with the basic values of your life. You can't just follow the crowd and be explaining the excuses. Your life can't be one apologetic. Your life is not an, apologe an apologetic statement. Your life is your life. It's a gift from God. And if God would give everyone here 10 years, we want to make it God's 10 years and not just follow the crowd. Now, you've had times when you just follow the crowd, right? I've had times I've, I've worn styles of clothes that I wish I wouldn't have worn, like when they had skin tight jeans when I was a, in high school and I couldn't get them off because my feet were too big. Um, you know, I've followed the crowd before, but I want to follow what God has for me. I remember one time I followed the crowd when we were all down at uh, Legoland and I was taking Elijah to the restroom and um, the whole, I mean, there's like t Disneyland times 10 and I was just following the crowd and everyone was going into the women's restroom and I just started going into the women's restroom <laughs> and realized that everyone around me was female and I picked up Elijah and we ran out as fast as we could. <laughs> because you can't live your life following the crowd, right? You might have had a dysfunctional family, you might have an illness. You might go through a divorce. You might have struggled in school. You might have economic opposition. But that's not going to define your life. We're going to allow God his best on the mountain peak experience to define our lives, to set our goals. We're going to listen to him. Look at his word. Be in holy conversation with wise people as we set the ideals for the next 10 years. Now, for me, the next 10 years, I think, um, after that, we'll probably ha hand the baton off to someone else to be the senior pastor of the church because I'm 60 years old, I'll be 70 years old. When I was in high school, I used to run every event in track, but I ran the quarter mile, which was my f favorite event, or the, actually the mile relay. And... Um, that decided the whole track meet. When they, they come along as the last event, they'd hand off, I ran the anchor on it. The guy would run along with me when they handed the baton to you. And then as you ran together in the same lane, hopefully, so you didn't get disqualified, everyone on the team was there. Every event was over. They're cheering. Come on, Tim, let's go. Let's win this race. And that's what we want to do for future generations the impact of this church is the next 10 years for me personally are the most important 10 years of my life. And we want to set visions and dreams that are from God when we do that. And the first thing I wanted to talk to you about is the vision that God is giving us for worship. The amazing things that God's going to do in all the different worship services of our church. So right now we have the Hispanic service going on. We have the Korean service going on. We've got the Brazilian service going on. We've got a youth service going on. We've got this service going on. We hope to have more and more services we spread throughout the city. Uh, we have an African-American church that's looking to join this revolution. What's God going to do in our midst as we learn to worship him, his way. How can he raise the bar in refreshing and energizing us and having it, having it work God's way? And that's why I ask you to turn to Exodus chapter 20 because it's the Ten Commandments. The kids in Sunday school are memorizing the Ten Commandments. And this is the fourth commandment. It says this, Remember, to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Only 10 commandments. I'm glad they didn't come out and say we've got 44 commandments, especially when I had to memorize them in Sunday school. Only 10 commandments. 10 seemed like a lot, but it's up there. It's up there with you must not commit adultery. Your spouse thinks that's a pretty important commandment, not one just to take easy. 
You must not steal. The law thinks that's a pretty important commandment, right? You must not testify falsely against your neighbor. You must not lie. You must not covet. Along with all of those commandments is remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. It's this idea of we were created to worship God. Now, I chose, I, Rex, at the beginning, he's a good planner. Rex said there's two weeks are going to be the hardest weeks this year when we play the Seahawks head-to-head um, at 10 o'clock, and they're going to be going on right through the service. And they're the biggest church in town. I mean, they have 60,000 people whenever they worship in town. They have millions that watch. When they go to church to, at the Seahawks church, uh, they don't have to wear their shoes. They can be sitting in an easy chair. Um, they can be holding a beer and eating chips. None of those things are welcome during this service. <laughs> I want you to keep your shoes on. No, no beer, no chips during the service. Um, and it's easy going. And it's fun. And the whole community's into it. Well, we are for the Seahawks too. But I said I want to take head to head the times when only uh, the brave and the bold would be here to set worship as a priority. It's interesting when the coaching staff, which is now at Green Bay, when the coaching staff of the Seahawks went to our church before they were fired and, and many moved on to Green Bay, uh, that they all made it to worship even on game day. They'd come on a Saturday night or they'd come on a Sunday morning. I don't know how they made it there in time. Maybe they were being superstitious, but they felt like that was a priority, that they would make it to service. And then when someone else would say, I would have come to church, but I, I, I just... I, um, Uh, The Seahawks game. I'd say, the coaches made it. (laughs) You can make it. And it reminds me of something that we need to hear, but we don't want to hear. Remember Dr. Jack Emmon that went to our church? Some of you remember him. He was a a Baptist minister that went on to get his PhD in psychology and was a prominent counselor in our community. And um, one of his favorite old stories when he preached, and I'll never forget it, he's gone on to heaven now, and he was on our staff as a pastor emeritus um, was about the guy who was out mount or climbing around and hiking around and he slips and falls and he falls off of this cliff and he just grabs onto a root and it's like a hundred feet down no way to climb up nothing to grab onto and so he starts yelling help help someone up there someone help me and all of a sudden he hears from heaven the voice of God I'm here. I am God. I will help you. He's like, wow, this is amazing. I didn't didn't even believe in God. What do you want me to do, God? And God says, just let go of that root and fall, and my angels will float you down to the bottom. The guy thinks about it for a minute and says, is anyone else up there? (laughs) He doesn't like that answer. And so here we hear this commandment that we were designed to worship. Now, we can worship athletic teams. We can worship pop culture. We can worship uh, the Kardashians. We can worship our car. Uh, We can sing songs of worship of how we love someone. But we were designed to place first in our lives the creator of the universe. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. To put Jesus Christ first. And that's the way we're designed. All of our culture is going to go against kids holding that as a priority. It's going to be one of the places that we're not to be stubborn, we're not to be strong. My parents influenced me that way. It wasn't a choice whether we were going to um, uh, go to school. Otherwise, you know, my kids, when I dropped them off for school, they'd say, now, Dad, why do I have to go to school? And I have to go through the whole thing again. It wasn't a choice whether we were going to school. It wasn't a choice that we weren't going to break the laws. It wasn't a choice that uh, we would uh, um, have dreams in our lives. And, and it wasn't a choice whether we'd worship. In those days, we'd come and we'd sit in the worship service. And I remember watching my grandpa at his church, and just there was nothing entertaining about it. He wore an old black robe, the hymn music. We used to sing the soprano part just because we thought it was funny. And, um, but when grandpa spoke, it was from his heart, and it was to people 
the word of God that they needed and he loved. And we, that was palatable. We could sense that spirit in those old Methodist chapels. We were raised that worship was a priority. In fact, when we were in school and they had any event on Sunday, even though we were all football players, all the boys in our family, we didn't attend any event on Sunday. They could have picture day. We weren't there at picture day because we set one day aside for worship. Now, you don't have to do that, but I just want to show you the the backbone and the fiber that has been around for 2,000 years of people that believe that worship's not an option. If you're sick, stay at home and worship. That we are designed to worship. I love that movie, Chariots of Fire. It reminds me of the movie that we're going to have made from this church when Boys in the Boat becomes a movie. But the movie Chariots of Fire, the true story of Eric Little, who was born as a missionary in China, returned to Scotland, and he finds out he's fast. He starts running races as a young man. His sister, who's concerned about his piety, says, you're really getting caught up in this too much because they had the Scottish Games, which they invited all of Europe to. And he won the 100, he won the 220, and he won the 440, or the quarter mile. And all this fame and attention came to him. That was the race in the movie where he fell down and everyone had a 20-yard lead on him and he got up and he still won the race. That was a historical fact and was basically the European Games. And his sister said, I'm afraid that you're taking this too serious. And he said, I, God made me fast and I feel his pleasure when I run. Wouldn't it be great to feel God's pleasure when you overcome hardship and and stress, and difficulty. In other words, you'd be too blessed to be stressed, right? Whatever the challenges that you have. And so, just the history is a lot like the movie. There are a few things that were actually different, but it came down when they went to the 1924 Olympics in Paris that he was one of the fastest men in the world in the 100-yard dash. He did have a great rivalry with a, um, a Jewish Cambridge star by the name of Abrams. And what wasn't shown in the movie was, since he was a Christian, he was actually pulling for his opponent. And you know that coach that Abrams had in the movie, if you remember that movie? You need to go watch it after the Seahawks game today. Um, It was Eric Little that recommended that coach to Abrams so that he could be better. And he ended up winning the championship, world championship, in the 100-yard dash. But when it came down to the preliminaries, they set the time, and it was on Sunday. Here's this conservative Christian who was raised in China, and he announced to the world, I can't run on Sunday. Well, the uh, Prince of Wales met him and intimidated him and said, you will run on Sunday. He said, I don't care what you do to me. I'm not running on Sunday. The Olympic Committee met with him and tried to intimidate him. He said, I'm not running on Sunday. On Sunday, he preached at a church in Paris, a Scottish Presbyterian church in in Paris, and he preached on Isaiah 40, that when you run, that even young people grow weary, but when when you run, you'll be restored like wings of like eagles by God. The principle of worship, that he needed to be restored. The strength of, the source of his strength was from God. The source of his values. So when we look at the next 10 years, we're not going to plan our children's lives by the statistics that are going on that say, well, the Americans becoming a post-Christian era and all churches are going to shrink or um, we're not going to plan our lives like that. It's going to become more and more immoral and and the world's going to fall apart. We're not going to plan it by the statistics. We're not going to plan it by what's popular and culture, we're not going to just follow the crowd. We're going to ask God, what do you want the next 10 years? And so another runner actually from Britain allowed him to run the 440. Everyone said, they don't even know if he has the stamina to run the quarter mile. But just before he got ready to run the 440, it was before the 100-yard dash, the then fastest man in the world, Dutch Schultz, um, was from the United States, was also a Christian. This was in the movie. He went up just before the race and he handed Eric Little a note. 
You know what that note said? It was a verse of scripture. And it said, he who honors me, I will honor. Do you believe that today? He or she who honors me, I will honor. We need to teach our kids to honor God, to honor him first. We want our marriages to grow strong, we need to honor God. You want to survive a divorce and have a better life ahead for you, you need to honor God. You're launching a business, you need to honor God. So Eric Little ran the 400 meters against the fastest people in the world, and he set a world record and won the gold medal. Well, what the movie doesn't tell, but my friend Jess Moody actually had a second movie made, which you can find on um, a DVD, and it was called Finishing the Race, was the rest of his life. Jess Moody was a famous Southern Baptist pastor in Hollywood and had a lot of connections there and said, we've got to tell the rest of the story. Because he went to China as a missionary just before World War II, a dangerous place to be. He was soon taken as a prisoner of war. And in 1943, he died in a prisoner of war camp. And it's true, just like it said in the movie, all of Scotland mourned Eric Little. Why? Because he was like everyone else? Because he just followed the crowd? No. Like John the Baptist, he was like no one else. He didn't follow the crowd. He followed God. And that happens when we come to worship, not ready to be a Entertain. Now, that's the culture that we have. And we believe that it's Christ over culture. It doesn't matter what culture people worship in. It doesn't matter what music style they have. It doesn't matter what the pastor looks like. It doesn't matter how cool everyone is. What matters is God. People can worship in a variety of ways. When we were down in Dallas. We went to this big church, and they had country music, and the, the lady that was singing, it was, it was smoke coming out, and the big band there, and, and everything, and the lady that was leading was about Jackie's age, but she was wearing skin-tight jeans with holes in them, and big hair, and, and lots of makeup and everything, and afterwards, Jackie said, boy, that lady just, uh, I liked everything except for the worship leader, and I said, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> But I said, we're in Dallas. Let Dallas people worship like they are in Dallas. She looked like she just fit in Dallas, right? So the Native American uh, congregation that's going to worship right after this service, they're going to worship differently than we are. Because it's Christ over culture. We're not coming here to be entertained. We're not coming here to be the best. We're coming here to listen to God. We're coming here to honor God, to show that he is an important part of our life. And you're sitting around people who are going to be graduating from medical school. They're going to have prominent careers. You're sitting around people that may be politicians. Be nice to them, even though they're going to be politicians. You're sitting around people with great and wonderful dreams. And they know one thing, even on a Seahawks Sunday, that they need to take time to worship the living God. So that's one of the Ten Commandments. Now if you turn with me over to John chapter 4, we'll see Jesus' preeminent theology on worship. It's not in a sermon, it's in a conversation. One of the privileges I had was to meet Daryl Bach, who's a, um, one of the preeminent New Testament scholars. Um, he's a great defender of the of veracity of God's Word. He's a professor of New Testament at Dallas Theological Seminary, and I got to shake hands with him and get to know him. I've read all of his books, so it's the first time I'd ever met him, and I was just kind of surprised. First of all, he was old. He was 61 years old. He was getting overweight and had a gray beard and gray hair and was balding. I just couldn't believe it. I was just kind of shocked by that. That's supposed to be a joke because <laughs> I'm 60, and I look like I was looking in the mirror. Um, but... Um, in the New Testament, we see Jesus having this conversation about worship, and it's a conversation with someone that he's not even supposed to talk to. The Samaritans and the Jews didn't like each other. You've heard many sermons about that. They disagreed about worship. This lady, when he finds out about her, is someone that we would love to reach at our church. She didn't conform to the mold. She had been married five times, and the man that she was living with wasn't her husband, and, and so... She's struggling in her own life. And she wants to talk about anything other than worship. She talks about worship, but then Jesus makes the point. 
And he said, you Samaritans, you worship on Mount Gerizim, which is from, from the, the well where they're at. You can see Mount Gerizim. And they today still worship on Mount Gerizim. They sacrifice animals on Mount Gerizim. They follow the first five books of the law. They're very similar to the Jews, but they're the Jews that were taken to Persian captivity instead of Babylonian captivity or left there. And the Samaritans and the Jews never got along. And they had a difference about worship, where worship was supposed to take place, on Mount Gerizim or in Jerusalem. And Jesus cuts to the heart. He says, it doesn't matter where you worship. A day is coming and is already here when everyone is going to worship in two ways, two important words, in spirit and in truth. Now we want to raise the spirit of worship. Now to raise the spirit of worship, God's Holy Spirit, to run free here so more miracles take place, so more lives are reached, is that we need to be clear as Washington Cathedral that worship is never about entertainment. Worship is not about us. It's not all about you. Worship is about God. So people can worship dif differently. There can be those that are charismatic and those that are non-charismatic. There can be those that are Catholic and those that are Orthodox. There can be those that are Protestant. There can be Nazarenes and there can be Baptists and there can be Methodists and there can be Lutherans. And there can be atheists. Because you don't even have to believe in God to worship God. Did you know that? Anyone in a foxhole worships God. Anyone in the hospital who's getting ready for open heart surgery is ready to worship God. I believe that. I've been a pastor for 41 years. I was talking to another pastor, and, and he said, you know, in, in 31 years of ministry, I've never led someone to God as they're in the hospital when they're facing their own mortality. And I said, well, I've been a pastor for 41 years, and I never have not led someone to Christ. I'm batting a thousand. It's the only area of my life where I'm batting a thousand. And then we talked about our approach. His approach was to come in, to make him repent, kind of make him join the club. My approach was, I know that you believe in God in this situation. Let me tell you about him. It's not how many, much money you gave that gets you into heaven. It's not how many times you taught Sunday school. It's not even how many times you went to church. We're received, just like the thief on the cross, because we receive Christ's love. Do you want to receive Christ's love? Everyone's like, why have I never heard this before? Because it's true. It's all about relationship. We're not here because we passed a law in our culture that you have to worship even if the Seahawks are playing at 10 o'clock, right? Because we'd probably uh, break that law. Um, we're here because we love Jesus Christ. We're here because we believe in God. We're here because we have a relationship. We have an appointment with God, one that we want to honor and it's important to us. And so that's why you can be an atheist and begin to worship. In a, down in our other sanctuary with the waterfall and the beautiful little sanctuary there, I remember the time that a family came in and they told me at the door that they're all atheists. A big family, there was school teachers and everything all there together coming to plan a service. And they said, we want you to know that we're not Christian. In fact, we, we all talked and we happened to all be atheists. And I said, that, that's fine. Our church ministers to people from all background. They came through the door and they literally fell on the floor. I didn't see any of you fall on the floor when you came in, came in and just started worshiping God. I just said, it's so beautiful here. They started crying. I don't know why we didn't listen to her. The her they were talking to was a young lady who came to church by herself. She had lots of questions. She met with Jackie. I think she graduated from Stanford or something. Just a very intelligent lady. They built a friendship. They'd meet over coffee every now and then. And she gave her life to Jesus Christ. She taught Sunday school. She was a school teacher, I think. She joined the choir. And at a young age, even though everything seemed to be going so well for her, she died of an aneurysm. And when they came through the door, they said, she was trying to get us to come to church. Why didn't we come? She said this church was friendly. This, she said this church was open-minded. She said this church would treat us with dignity. She told us how beautiful the waterfall. It's more beautiful than we thought it was. And they were worshiping even though they didn't believe in God. Why? Because God is all around us. The birds worship God. Listen to him sing. 
Do you ever hear a bird sing with a bad attitude? Not counting crows? <laughs> no, they sing with gusto, don't they? And stars and the solar systems, they proclaim the glory of God. That's what it says in Romans, that even the, those who don't believe in God can see the law written in the universe. You're not measured by your doctrine or your denomination, by your church, but it's by receiving God's love. And we come here because we believe that the next 10 years is not going to be written by terrorists, the history of the next 10 years. It's not going to be written by falling morality. It's not going to be written by um, mental illness that would cause people that go in for shootings and all the other things that go on. It's going to be written by our capacity to show God's love to lonely, hurting people. And we get to be a part of that. So we're here to worship. We think, we think it makes a difference. We know it makes a difference in our marriages. We know it makes a difference to a person who's gone through a divorce. We know it makes a difference for a person who's been raised in a dysfunctional family. We know it makes a difference for a person that's out of work and going through the pain of trying to find a new job and how difficult it is. We know it makes a difference for a person who's desperately lonely. We know it makes a difference for a person who has great and impossible dreams because we worship in spirit and truth. We want the kids to have a spirit that they can't dismiss. You know how I always say we want to have a love that, that um, what do, you know what I always say, I can't remember. <laughs> a love they can't resist. We want them to have a spirit they can't dismiss. That's going to be working on them their whole life. They see it in their mom and their dad. They see it around them and the people in the church. That's the spirit of God. So when we sing songs, we're not singing to impress TJ, but we want to impress TJ. Now, I can sense that when TJ sings, he's singing to God. When Ted plays the drums, he's playing drums for God. When I sing, as bad as it sounds, I'm singing to God. And I might have chosen another song, but I'm not thinking about that. I'm not crit critiquing the sermon. I'm not critiquing the building or the budget. I'm not critiquing the, the leadership. I'm worshiping the living God and the time set aside to worship him. I'm modeling for my children and my grandchildren because when I hand that baton off to my grandchildren, and that's happening even now, because I, when I was a little boy and it was time to go to bed, my dad always tucked us in when he was home or my mom, and they would always tell us a story. And when grandpa was over, um, they'd say, let grandpa tell you a story. He's the king of the storytellers. So when I was down in Texas, when it was time to tuck Elijah in bed, uh, Elise said, let GP tell you a story. And I'd go in and I'd tell the same story. My grandpa would tell. My dad would tell. Because I was passing a baton to someone I love. Passing faith and hope and love and spirit that would form the character of his life. Not the difficulties. Not the hardships. Not the burdens. It would be a God that he loves and recognizes that he can't live without. And that's the vision I have for worship. We're going to grow. We're going to launch more and more congregations. There's going to be more and more diversity in our church. There are going to be more and more people that will catch dreams. I'm determined that that's going to happen. I'll invest everything I have financially, physically, emotionally, spiritually to make sure that God has his way with Washington Cathedral. I want to be stubborn about that. And it's going to happen. Because it's not just me saying it's going to happen. God wants to have his way. And we're going to allow him to have his way. Stand with me for the closing benediction. Now unto him who is able to bless you. To keep you strong. To do far more than you could ever ask or imagine. Lord Jesus, we, we need you in our lives. We need you keep us too blessed to be stressed. God, we ask that you correct our hearts and correct our minds. You ask, we ask that you can help us as we hand off the baton to our children and grandchildren, the children of this church that we all care about and pray for. God, we ask that we could grow in our capacity 
to really worship you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.